And let's go over here and look at this other one. And I actually didn't do this right. We need one more person here, right? So we've got this three-party system going on here where the bank loans you money, you sign the IOU, and then you use the deed of trust to that third party trustee, right? That is the title theory system. Now you miss a couple payments and literally the bank calls who? Who owns the property? The third party trust. The trust owns it. So they literally just call over to this person and that's the symbol. I'm trying to draw it dot in there. It's supposed to be an ear. They call over and go, hey, sell the house. And the third party goes, okay. It's their job. They don't have to argue. Because there's no argument in this, this is called a non-judicial foreclosure. We do not need a judge to intercede because there is no argument between the lender and and the true owner of the property. What the lender will do is tell that third party that's guiding the trust, there is a special clause inside of that called the power of sale, and they will literally call over to that third party and go, hey, sell the house and give us the money. That is non-judicial because there's no argument. That third party trustee goes, okay, we'll do it. That's our job. We only need this one because me and the lender are arguing over what that actual contract says. That's why a judge has to get involved. Now, there could be this thing called a strict foreclosure where the actual third party lender or the bank just says, hey, deed us the house back directly and we will deal with all of that. Okay. So there is a judicial and non-judicial. Now, sometimes when you get into this issue, and I told you we argue over the difference. Hey, I believe I was supposed to get 19 months. And the bank and the lender says, no, you weren't. You could actually go, hey, dude, <laughs> I know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. I know the judge is going to say I'm wrong. How about I deed you the property in lieu of, which means instead of, us going to foreclosure court. This is called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. <clears throat> you will often hear this and sometimes say it's a friendly foreclosure because literally what you're doing is admitting guilt up front and saving everybody the time it's still a foreclosure process, but it's friendly because you're not really arguing it. You're not being a butthole and making everybody go to court because, dude, you are going to lose. All right. So you actually forfeit the property and potentially any of the equity back to the lender to just move on with this and keep going. Now, if you do that, you would deed back to the bank through a quit claim. And a quit claim deeds what? It deeds that person's interest. If that person had any junior liens on the property, they would become the bank's problem. Now, in the Indiana people, if you're listening, Indiana is one of the six states in the nation that actually pay our taxes a whole year in arrears. So even on a free and clear house, there is going to be a tax lien on your property for last year. So I tell everybody in Indiana, a deed in lieu of foreclosure is kind of like a unicorn. Hey, they're great in theory, but you're never going to see one in the real world because they don't exist. Same thing happens with this in Indiana. Because the bank would inherit those junior liens, they would, in fact would be liable for the taxes on that house. And they're not going to want that. So while a deed in lieu exists, not really in the Indiana area, 
because they don't want that tax liability back as the bank, okay? Now, <clears throat> there is this time frame in which their lender will actually provide an opportunity for the defaulting borrower to redeem their property so that they can get their house back. And let's talk about this. So when they file that foreclosure, there is a date of court. All right. And that court date gets established. Prior to that court date, you as the borrower, even if you are in default, even if you are in pre foreclosure, you can still sell the property. It's yours. And you would have what's called the equitable right of redemption. Meaning, even up to the date, you could walk into the lender and go, dude, what do I owe? And they say, well, you owe that... Uh, 99750 plus we've tacked on $50 of late fee. You owe $99,800. And you go, you know what? I just had a good night at the casino last night. Here's your $99,800 and pay off that lien. Take me out of the foreclosure court case because I no longer have this issue. I paid you off. And though you can remember the word equitable, right? Because equity means money. I paid you the money I owe. And I have that right up until the date. There is a second right for a time frame after that foreclosure date. It is a state law. The word we use for law is statutory. right of redemption all right now if you're out there i want all eyes on me because i want you to hear me say this if you are listening in indiana indiana does not practice this law florida does not practice this law arizona does practice this law you would have the right for 365 days after the foreclosure to redeem your property back. Because it is a state law, that is where the word statutory comes from. That's how you can remember it. Before the court date, you have the equitable right of redemption, pay what you owe. And after that court date, there is a law that protects you called the statutory right of redemption. Some states practice it. Some states do not. Now, while we're here, I want to add something in the other chapter because it's the same law and I want you to see it. Let's talk about the taxes. Completely different concepts. So bear with me. We're switching. If you haven't paid your real estate taxes, the state will put you in the tax sale. It too will have a date. Up until that tax sale, you still have that equitable right of redemption and go, hey dude, how much do I owe you in taxes? They say, you've got $8,000 in back taxes. Here's the 8,000, take me out of the tax sale. It's the same law. It works the same way. After the tax sale for 365 days, there is a statutory right of redemption, which says you have one year to pay your back taxes plus some penalty to redeem your property back. The reason I did these together is because most every state practices that law, including Indiana. All right. So understand for foreclosure, there is the equitable law and the statutory law. Indiana does not practice statutory right of redemption for foreclosure. 
for taxes, you still have the same equitable right of redemption and statutory, and virtually every state practices, that's not entirely true. The states, there are some states, but we don't teach in them, so who cares, right? If you're listening to this, this probably means the statutory right of redemption is practice, okay? So those are the two rules that allow you to redeem the equitable right of redemption and the statutory. And the easy way to remember it is statutory means state law. So you get protected under that after the uh, time frame, whereas equitable is before, okay? Uh, Deficiency judgment, that's really what I want to talk about here. When you owe that property and the, the judge says, hey, Raymond, you owe that 99750 and you say, hey, judge, I don't have the money. And the judge says, okay, Raymond, go ahead and give them the collateral, <clears throat> i.e. give them the house so that they can sell it and get their money back. Now, what happens if that lender sells that house, but he sells it for less than what you actually owed. You would be caught with what is called a deficiency. And most lenders, the very first place they take that house is to the sheriff sale. So they want that $99,700 but you don't have it, so they take your house from you, and then they walk over to the sheriff <laughs> and hand the sheriff the house and go, hey, sell this house. And the sheriff says, okay. And he sells it for, let's say, $99,000 even. The bank got 99000 but yet you owed them 99750 You are liable for the difference between those, there is a deficiency. This is the same rule if you've ever had a car repoed. Don't raise your hand, but if you've ever had a car repoed and you owed 5000 on it, but they took it to the auction and only got 3000 there's still two more thousand dollars you owe. That's a deficiency. It would become a judgment against you. It would go on your credit history as a deficiency judgment that you owe Fifth Third Bank $750. All right. So that is the deficiency would be the difference between what you got billed at, i.e. the foreclosure, and what it actually sold at. Now, there is a situation that we have touched on already that potentially... This house that we have been talking about, where you owe, let's start with a new one. You owed an outstanding bill of $99,750. You can't make the payments. And you have proven to the bank, dude, due to the economy, due to the market, due to whatever reason, this house now only comps out at $95,000. You know, maybe the highway came through. They took the property beside me. They have made my house the one that backs up to the highway. It's only worth ninety nine. dollars I owe you $99,750. We could go to court through foreclosure. You probably are going to win, Mr. Linder and get a judgment for 99750 but when you go to sell it you are not going to get that 99750 you are probably going to get 95000 out of it because it has now for some reason lost value how about i find a buyer that'll just pay us $95000 now save all of that time and effort and the foreclosure by selling the property for less 
or short of what I owed you. This is a short sale. We touched on it very early when we had talked about contingencies. This is a situation <clears throat> where the borrower or the seller that borrowed the money owes $99,750, but they have proven through a series of documentations, I've lost my job, I don't have the ability to pay that loan, and the house is now not worth what it was. Basically, what they have to do is prove to that lender that they no longer qualify for the loan they got three years ago. So it is a very involved and long and tedious process. I've done a number of these and they can take anywhere from six to eight to 12 months just to get the bank to agree to take this 95,000. You thought that they crawled up that consumer's rear end to get a loan? Wait till they try and crawl up this consumer's rear end to get a short sale because they are going to look at everything. Does this consumer like have a brokerage account? I mean, like a stock brokerage. Do they own other property? Where are, are there any other places they could get this money from? So you have to prove a whole bunch of stuff as the agent. So what ends up happening is you attract a buyer and go, hey, look, buyer come on in, buy this property, and you are going to pay 95000 for it, but I am going to have to get a first lien removal contingency. Remember that contingency? I have to uh, get the lender to approve this offer because I actually owe more. I can't sell it outright to you because without the lender's approval, I would have to pay $4,750 to sell my property. But if I got the lender's approval to accept your offer of 95, I would sell it to you and they would clear the lien off so that you do get that first, that general warranty deed that says, I remove all the encumbrances. Well, I will because the lender has agreed to accept short of what I owed. That is a short sale and it has to be lender approved. It will have to be disclosed and it is very hard and time consuming to do.